This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the video for Unit 11 on the endocrine system. There's only one video for this unit since this is another one week unit. In the body there are two communication systems that relay information from one part of the body to the other. We've already talked about the nervous system and how it uses electrical impulses down the nerve cells and chemical neurotransmitters across the synapses in order to have some rapid or short-term, precisely directed crisis management type of action. In comparison, we're going to be talking about the endocrine system today, which also uses chemicals, but we call these chemicals hormones. And in the endocrine system, you have a slower, long-term changes in your metabolism, which usually are affecting more than one organ. So the nervous system is quick and fast and very precise, moving down nerves. The endocrine system is much more general, but it covers more, potentially covers more of the body, and it has a longer-lasting effect. This little diagram gives you some ideas about those two um, systems and how they work. The first two here are both part of the endocrine system, where you have hormones either emitted or secreted by an endocrine cell. It moves into the bloodstream and ends up at some other target cell. So in the endocrine system, you're talking about hormones being secreted from an endocrine gland at one place in the body and working on a target cell in another place of the body. And then sometimes in the endocrine system, you have a neurosecretory cell, a nerve cell that secretes a neurotransmitter that also acts as a hormone, but it again goes into the bloodstream, not synapsing with another nerve cell, but into the bloodstream to a target cell at some distance. And then finally, here's our nerve system that we're familiar with, where one nerve cell sends information to another nerve cell. So when we're talking about the endocrine system, we have endocrine glands that secrete hormones that move into the bloodstream to reach a target cell. Some hormones will be able to be uh, a target, will have many target cells throughout the body. Other hormones are very specific and they only work with a particular target cell. Within the endocrine system, we also have some paracrine and autocrine glands autocrine glands are secreting a hormone that work on itself. That's where the word auto comes from, referring to that self, that own cell. So it's sort of uh, very, very close and local. Paracrine, paracrine is also another local action where hormones secreted by one endocrine cell are working on the cells around it. But most of what we're going to talk about today are going to be this more general endocrine system where you have a distance between your glands and your target cells. We've already talked about exocrine glands that have ducts that secrete their products to a particular site. We were talking about the skin. We talked about sebaceous glands and sweat glands. These are exocrine glands because they have ducts that deliver the secretions that they make to a particular place. So we have a little diagram here showing your endocrine gland on the right in comparison to your exocrine gland. And you can see the little duct work here um, on the left. Hormones do quite a few things in the body. You all think about hormones probably in relation to sexual development, but they also are just a very important part of everyday regulation of the metabolism that's going on. So they may control the rates of chemical reactions or change how things move across the cell membrane. They're very important in maintaining water and electrolyte balance, the homeostatic part of uh, keeping all those, elect all those chemical components of your body in just the right proportions. And hormones also trigger big events in the cell, things like mitosis or starting transcription and translation of a particular gene. These things are all regulated by hormones. The endocrine glands that we're going to be talking about in this unit and focusing on are shown here on the picture. Particularly, we're going to be talking about the pituitary gland and some of the work that the hypothalamus does in triggering things in the pituitary gland the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the pancreas, and on the other side, the parathyroid gland. We'll be mentioning what happens with the pineal gland, the kidney, and the various gonadal uh, ovaries in women and testes in men, but those will not be covered in detail, and also the thymus will not be covered in detail. There are two ways that hormones are put together, their chemical structure. They are either steroid-like hormones, 
And these are all built from cholesterol as the building block. Cholesterol is a ring structure, so you can see all these rings over here in the, the picture of steroids. Then you have non-steroid hormones, which are basically coming from some type of protein structure. Things as small as amines, which are just a f amino acid, or you know, tiny little bit more than an amino acid, up to big glycoproteins, which contain both a carbohydrate and a protein um, component. So that you have both steroid hormones, steroid hormones being part of cholesterol are lipid soluble and can move through the cell membrane as we see here. And then your protein or amino acid based hormones which will not move through the cell membrane because they are um, not fat soluble and have to be picked up by a receptor on the surface of the cell membrane and then trigger action in the cell as that receptor uh, starts a chain reaction. Looking at some specific examples, the amine hormones are norepinephrine and epinephrine, and there are many more hormones than we'll, I will be talking about in this video. These are sort of the big ones, the ones that you need to know for this particular course, but they are in no means an exhaustive list. So your amine hormones are quite small in size because they're just not much bigger than an amino acid. Peptides are slightly larger, and so some of the hormones that we'll be talking about, the antidiuretic hormone, uh, oxytocin, and um, those are the two big ones in that category. Proteins, a little bit larger again. We have the parathyroid hormone, growth hormone. Glycoproteins, which contain both a protein and a carbohydrate. We have the follicle-stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormones, which um, we'll be talking about in more detail when we get to reproduction later on in this course. And then the thyroid-stimulating hormone we'll be looking at more in this unit. And then the various steroids, the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, and then two hormones that are produced by your adrenal gland, aldosterone and cortisol. Here's a diagram that talks about how the steroid hormones cause things to happen in the cell. Because steroid hormones are fat soluble, they can move through the cell membrane, as I said. They're carried in the blood plasma, and they're actually carried connected, weakly bonded to another protein, so that allows them to travel through that heavily water-based medium. When the steroid hormone reaches the target cell, then it moves through the cell membrane. It is picked up by a receptor protein in the cytoplasm, and then that hormone receptor complex moves into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, the uh, hormone receptor complex binds to DNA and starts triggers transcription of a particular gene so that you get mRNA and then eventually moves out to the cytoplasm and has translation and you end up with a protein. And so this, uh, with steroid hormones, they are actually moving into the cell, moving into the nucleus, triggering the production of a particular protein, expressing a particular gene. The action of non-steroid hormones, though, because they cannot move into the cell, happens in a different way. And for some reason, my first recording of this slide got lost, but it kept all of my scribbles. So you'll just have to bear with me here. But um, in a non-steroid hormone, as I said before, they cannot move into th the cell through the cell membrane so that the hormone, like epinephrine here, will be picked up by a receptor that is found in the cell membrane. And this is why hormones work, because there are receptors there to bind with the hormone. You see with a steroid hormone, there has to be a receptor in the cell to pick it up before it can move into the nucleus. And epinephrine or another non-steroid hormone, there has to be a receptor on the cell membrane to pick it up. That's why there are target cells. The hormones, even though they're going through the bloodstream, will not affect every cell because if there is not a receptor, nothing will happen. So anyway, moving back to the procedure, as the hormone is picked up by the receptor, the receptor will somehow change its shape because this is a three-dimensional protein structure and adding that hormone is going to change how bonds are working, how the protein is folding, and so then it triggers the change in another protein. So your receptor protein then triggers a change in a protein called a G protein, which is right next to it onto the cell membrane. The G protein then triggers the action of an enzyme that will make a 
a product called CAMP or cyclic AMP from ATP. And the, um, in the non-steroid hormone process, the hormone is known as the first messenger, not first mess as you see here, but first messenger. And then this cyclic AMP is known as the second messenger. There are also other compounds besides CAMP that are involved in this role, but um, they're not important for you to know for this particular course. So anyway, CAMP is made, and it starts a chain reaction where um, enzymes known as protein kinases are activated, and they then will change by putting phosphates, you see this phosphorylase, putting phosphates on various proteins, which will then have some end result, where in this case we're seeing the production of glucose from like glycogen. Um, because the activation of the G protein and the uh, various other steps that happen inside the cell uh, tend to be a cascade where many molecules are made, the non-steroid hormones produce a situation of amplification or a one-to-many response. One molecule of hormone can produce many molecules of results. The G proteins are very important in, uh, have been identified to being important in several disorders that a G protein that is missing or not the right shape will basically stop the process very early on. The hormone can bind to the receptor, but nothing else can happen because the G protein then becomes the missing link in the middle of the process. And so some of the things that have been identified are certain types of color blindness or a condition called retinitis pigmentosa where the, the retina slowly um, breaks down and is unable to, a uh, person loses their sight, or a couple of thyroid disorders are all because these G proteins are missing or malformed, and so they become now non-functional. So you see here that the hormone is not directly interacting with the cell, but because it is landing on the receptor, it starts a chain reaction that ends up things happening inside the cell because it is present outside the cell. Prostaglandins are another chemical that are involved in regulation, regulating cell metabolisms and what, what cells do. It is a fat-based chemical that is made by nearly all of our cells, and they, it's a paracrine substance. It is secreted and affects the cells surrounding the particular secreting cells. Um, it may have a role in respond, how our cells respond to the hormones that are being produced, but some of the other effects here are listed. You can see in this little diagram here on the left, we have a number of things that are consti constitutive, and these are genes that are continually being expressed. And so you can see some of the homeostatic functions that are influenced by prostaglandins. Where you don't want to have prostaglandins triggered is because they also can cause inflammation and pain. And uh, aspirin works because it deactivates prostaglandins, but it also, um, the other effect of aspirin is that it thins your blood because it also deactivates prostaglandins. You can see platelet formation is one of the things that is uh, on the left side here of something that was that is a normal and helpful r responsibility of prostaglandins. And so uh, with aspirin, it's working on the inflammation side, but it's also working on this other side to make the platelets not so effective. And so... Um, Prostaglandins are, are kind of, they're included in the endocrine system. They're not one of the hormones that are moving through the bloodstream, though, to reach a far away target cell. They are affecting the cells that surround the one that's secreting the various prostaglandins. So how are hormones controlled? How do we get the right amount? Well, we've got several negative feedback mechanisms going on in all of our hormonal loops. More particularly, there are three ways that hormones are triggered or inhibited um, from being secreted. In many cases, the hypothalamus is involved in producing releasing factors, which then stimulate hormone production in the anterior pituitary. We have a five important hormones that are coming out of the anterior, anterior pituitary gland, which we'll get to in a minute. And so the hypothalamus produces releasing factors, which in encourages hormone production in the anterior pituitary, some of which those um, anterior pituitary hormones are even releasing factors that stimulate production in yet another gland. So it's a two-step process in some of these hormones. 
We also have the nervous system directly stimulating glands. You have nerve fibers going directly to the gland and stimulating its action in secreting hormones instead of going through the hypothalamus. And in some cases, a particular substance in the blood plasma stimulates hormone production on a high level or a low level of particular substance such as blood glucose or blood calcium will trigger a particular hormone production. So let's start with the pituitary gland, one very important endocrine gland. If you remember, the pituitary lay, lies sort of in the central bottom part of your brain, um, down there below the hypothalamus, the diencephalon, and so here's our hypothalamus, and right below that is this little pituitary gland. It's surrounded by the sphenoid bone, and it's you know very much protected and sort of buried deep in your brain. And you can see it has two lobes in it, the anterior and the posterior lobe. So we've got two sections of the pituitary that work in two different ways. The anterior pituitary depends on the hypothalamic releasing factors to trigger one of the five different types of cells to stimulate its hormones. The, this is a portal system, so you see you've got capillaries that come back together to make a vein that then will broaden out again into capillaries, and so this is again when you have capillaries making a vein um, moving into an organ, it's known as a portal system. We saw that with the hepatic portal, and so we've got a pituitary portal. And the, um, so this is the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland receives releasing factors from the cells in the hypothalamus coming down into the bloodstream, that blood flowing into the anterior pituitary, and then it releasing hormones that move to the rest of the body. As I said, some of these pituitary hormones are actually stimulating factors that go on to stimulate release in another endocrine gland. So these are the five important um, hormones that are happening in the pituitary here, in the anterior pituitary, in this purple strip. So we have the adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which goes then to the adrenal cortex in the kidney and produces hormones that we'll talk about later called corticosteroids. You have the thyroid stimulating hormone that goes on to the thyroid. So again, both of these are part of that two-step process so that we end up with thyroid hormones being, being produced. The luteinizing hormone and the follicle-stimulating hormone go on to the gonads, the testes or the ovaries, to produce the various sex hormones. And then two direct action hormones, prolactin, which is involved in milk production for women that are lactating, and growth hormone, which is involved in bone and muscle growth. It is it's certainly very important for when you are growing as a child, but you need growth hormone throughout your life to repair and rebuild your muscles. This top layer <clears throat> gives you the releasing hormones that are coming from the hypothalamus that are triggering then the production of these hormones by the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary has an entirely different mechanism. In its case, the nerves from the hypothalamus go all the way down to the posterior pituitary. So they are directly connecting with the blood system in the posterior pituitary. There are no secretory cells in the posterior pituitary. The nerve cells that are secreting the hormones are up in the hypothalamus. The two hormones that are produced by the posterior pituitary are antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, and oxytocin. So this diagram re refers to those hormones from the pituitary gland and gives a few more details. So we've got thyroid stimulating hormone that moves to the thyroid to produce the um, various thyroid hormones that we're going to talk about. The adrenocorticotropic hormone, which I mentioned, which goes to the adrenal cortex and stimulates the cortical steroids. The um, antidiuretic hormone, which is also known as vasopressin, so this is earlier referred to as ADH, found in the, um, or acting on the kidneys. Growth hormone that I've mentioned is involved in growing your body as you grow from childhood into adulthood, but also for general repair and maintenance of your muscles and your cell metabolism the rest of your life. 
follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone involved in stimulating ovulation, um, sperm development, just encouraging the various hormones that are needed for sexual development. Oxytocin is involved in childbirth. It stimulates the contractions of the uterus, so this is not a hormone that is produced all the time, but just when it is needed. It's also involved in releasing milk when someone is breastfeeding a baby. It's part of the milk letdown reflex. Prolactin is needed to produce milk, so this again is only seen in women when she is pregnant or just after having a baby. Disorders of the pituitary gland, the ones that are probably most common are ones involved in the growth hormone, so that if you do not get enough growth hormone produced as you are growing, you will end up with one type of dwarfism. And this man over here in the picture uh, is probably, I couldn't find a reference to this, but it's likely that he is the person known under the stage name of Tom Thumb, who uh, traveled with Barnum and Bailey Circus. And then the opposite of dwarfism, and, in, and dwarfism that's produced by a pituitary disorder results in a person who's got normal proportions just being very small, whereas the um, dwarfism caused by the defective gene that causes your, your long, blo- long bones not to uh, keep growing results in someone who's, who has disproportions compared to what is considered normal. Giantism would be the opposite of dwarfism, someone that has too much growth hormone, and then you can end up with a person who is eight feet tall. And if someone has, because of a tumor, um, growth hormone being produced in their adulthood after they have stopped growing, they have a condition known as acromegaly. And since the bones cannot grow anymore, where you see things growing in a person with acromegaly are the cartilage areas or the bones that are not your long bones. So this woman over here shows a comparison of before and after, and you can see how her face has broadened, her nose uh, has gotten wider, her jaws have gotten wider. Um, Just the bones that are not long bones will thicken and get larger when acromegaly is present. Uh, Cartilage areas will also increase in size, but they won't, persons will not grow taller if they are an adult. This happens because there's been a tumor on the pituitary, not because of some um, problem genetically with the pituitary throughout life. Another disorder involving pituitary hormones is something called diabetes insipidus. This is not the same as the common diabetes mellitus, which is involved with high blood sugar levels. The diabetes word in both of those conditions, diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus, refers to um, the feelings of, of wanting to drink a lot, being thirsty, and then having a high urine output. In the case of diabetes mellitus, the blood sugar, high blood sugar levels trigger that type of behavior. But in diabetes insipidus, it's because of an imbalance in the antidiuretic hormone, and so too much water is being retained in the urine and um, instead of being reabsorbed by the body as it normally is in the kidneys. The thyroid gland is the next endocrine gland I want to talk about. Thyroid is found just below the larynx in your throat, and it produces three very important hormones. T3, triiodothyronine, and T4, T4, which can be called tetraiodothyronine, or more commonly it's just called thyroxine. And these are produced in what are known as the follicular cells. If you look at this structure over here in this diagram, you see we've got a central cavity called a colloid. And surrounding it, we have a layer of simple cuboidal epithelial cells. These are your follicular cells. And in these cells, these two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, are produced. The 3 and the 4 refer to how many atoms of iodine are present, or iodine, 3 in T3 and 4 in T4 for obvious reasons. Then these other cells that are found in the thyroid are known as the extra follicular cells and they produce a hormone called calcitonin which is involved in calcium keeping calcium levels appropriate in the blood. The parathyroid gland is found on the back side of the thyroid. So we've got four usually four little parathyroid glands and you can see this is looking um, at the the Here's the trachea and then the esophagus. So this is coming from the pharynx of the mouth. So on the back side of the thyroid, you have the parathyroid. Para means beside. Um, So we've got about paracrine glands that deal with 
putting hormones affecting the cells beside the cell secreting, and parathyroid is beside the thyroid. They only secrete one hormone, the parathyroid hormone, so that's easy to remember um, what it means, and it works with calcitonin with blood calcium levels. So here talks about these uh, hormones that we've mentioned. The parathyroid hormone is involved in bringing up blood calcium level. So if blood calcium level is too low, parathyroid secretion is increased so that more calcium is released into the bloodstream. Remember, calcium is involved in muscle contraction, and so it's important to have the right amount of calcium present so that your muscle cells can stay in the right balance so far as calcium inside and calcium outside so they can respond when contraction is required, such as keeping your heart beating. But if there's too much calcium floating around the, beds, the bloodstream, calcitonin from the thyroid is released and it tones down the calcium. That's one way to remember it. Calcitonin tones down the calcium in the blood. It sends it back to the bone. So parathyroid pulls it from the bones into the blood. Calcitonin takes it out of the blood and sends it back to the bones. So the amount of circulating calcium in the blood stays at the correct level. It is the level of calcium that triggers the release of these hormones. So the control is actually based on the amount of this substance floating in the blood's plasma. T3 and T4 are involved in overall metabolism. Um, the, you know, the rate of many chemical reactions that are going on in your body, breaking down the various nutrients in food for energy, producing ATP, maintaining um, body temperature, heart rate, and such. And so it, your, your basal metabolic rate, the amount of, you know, kind of have the speed of your own metabolism, is determined by your level of these two thyroid hormones. Having too much or too little of these thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, cause a number of disorders. So hyperthyroidism is having too much T3 or T4 produced, and so it sort of ramps up the body. Somebody with hyperthyroidism is, you know, using up nutrients and calories in cells or salaries in food more rapidly. They tend to have weight loss, elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure. They're sort of in a constant state of, um, you know, on edge. One of the other side effects of hyperthyroidism is this, it's not very big in this particular but picture, but you can see that her eyes are seemingly slightly larger than normal, and it, um, hyperthyroidism creates a swelling of the tissues behind the eye and actually pushes the eyeball forward. You can find some much more extreme examples on the web. You also can see a um, enlargement here of the thyroid in the neck. This is called a goiter and one of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism is a goiter. But the goiter in general can come along if there's just not enough iodine available and so that's what's seen down here in this other picture in developing countries where people are not uh, on a variety enough variety in their diet, then they can develop a goiter, which is not related to hyperthyroidism, but because there's not enough iodine present. Salt is iodine is included in table salt to prevent goiter developing in the United States. It was uh, an early additive to our food supply in response to a deficiency disease. Graves' disease is one particular type of hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is if there's not enough thyroid hormones being produced. And this other picture here of this young child is someone who suffers from hypothyroidism, a condition known as cretinism. This is a person that is born with the potential for normal intelligence, but because thyroid hormones are not being produced by their body, they become developmentally delayed, intellectual delays, a poor muscle tone, um, just a very bad state. It needs to be discovered within the first month or so of life so that, that hormones can be supplemented. If, if that is discovered, then the person has the potential of, of a normal life staying on the medication. Um, during development, prenatal development, the mother's body is supplying all the thyroid hormones, and so cretinism doesn't show up until after the baby is born when it's dependent on its own thyroid production. Moving on to the adrenal glands, you find your adrenal glands on your kidneys. 
They are found um, on both kidneys, one right, so you have a right adrenal gland and a left adrenal gland. There are two parts to the adrenal gland. There's the cortex around the outside and the medulla in the center, and each part produces different kinds of hormones. The adrenal cortex produces those steroid-based hormones of aldosterone, cortisol, and the sex hormones, whereas the adrenal medulla secretes the non-steroid hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So looking at those hormones in a little more detail, epinephrine and norepinephrine are, uh, produce effects that are like an extension of the sympathetic nervous system. So that your sympathetic nervous system, you know, the you know, increased heart rate and such, well, those uh, nervous responses are very short-term, very rapid, and very, but also very short-term. And so the sympathetic nervous system starts this reaction, the fight-or-flight response, but then epinephrine and norepinephrine continue it and keep it going for much longer so that these two things are partnered to allow your body to be geared up and ready to respond in times where, you know, quick action is needed and you need to have strength and, and you know, your muscles and your heart and your brain all have to be functioning at top level. Aldosterone works along with the antidiuretic hormone to keep the blood volume at the proper levels. It specifically works on sodium ions, keeping sodium ions in the proper amount so that the water will be moving in or out of the bloodstream as needed so that blood pressure and blood volume will be maintained. Sex hormones are produced both by the adrenal gland and also by the gonadal organs, the ovaries and the testes. The ones that are produced by the adrenal gland pretty much stay constant throughout life. They're probably the ones that are involved in starting sexual development to begin with. The uh, hormones produced by the ovaries and testes are much more fluctuating over life. They decrease with life. In the case of women, the estrogen production and progesterone production stops at menopause. Um, men do also have a decrease in testosterone as they age, but the sex hormones produced by the um, adrenal glands seem to be more constant. Then cortisol. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone because it is one that is released when you experience physical or emotional stress. Um, it is involved in producing blood glucose, keeping blood glucose levels available and high so that you can respond, uh, you know, keep your metabolism up when you are in time, uh, times of stress, keeps your blood glucose um, level. And it also, because of that, it, it uh, is known as the blood sparing hormone because it increases the use of amino acids and fats for energy by other cells so that blood glucose remains available for brain cells because brain cells are only able to use glucose for energy, whereas the rest of your body can draw upon amino acids and fats, break them down for the uh, use of, or excuse me, for the use of energy. Um, but over, if you've got cortisol being produced over a long period of time, you not if you are suffering, not suffering from a particular disorder, but just are living in a time of stress, you can have some negative effects because excess cortisol secretion actually decreases your ability to fight off infection because it decreases the um, lymphocyte production or, so that your resistance to infection goes down. It also then makes you susceptible to certain cancers. We've gotten some good information about the relationship between continual high level of cortisol and cancers. Um, it also is involved in perhaps increasing your risk of high blood pressure and heart disease and ulcers. So having a whole lot of stress in your life is affecting your cortisol levels, and then those cortisol levels are affecting your overall health. So the two adrenal gland disorders, both con that I want to talk about, both concern cortisol. Too much cortisol being produced, hypersecretion of cortisol, causes Cushing syndrome, whereas too little cortisone ca cortisol causes Addison's disease. Too much cortisol causes such things as uh, upper body obesity, especially around the face, creating something called a moon face, somebody getting a lot of, uh, you know, very rounded looking face. Also, they often have fat here in the back of the neck uh, being laid down in something called a buffalo hump. Um, women may grow hair where they naturally did not grow hair, hirsuteness, um, just general mental fatigue, not really being able to think, um, a variety of sort of 
minor symptoms in so far as fatigue and, and you know just not functioning well. Cushing syndrome can also be triggered by heavy use of prescription glucocorticoids, which are often prescribed for inflammation. Hydrocortisone, if you've used hydrocortisone cream, is actually cortisol. Addison's disease uh, shows um, such triggers as, again, fatigue and uh, you know, weakness of the body, um, digestive issues, and sort of a, a redness to the complexion. And this is JFK shown here in this picture, and he actually suffered from Addison's disease. And so sort of that, um, you know, look like he's been out in the sun sort of look is more a condition of Addison's than it actually was of being tanned. Both of these two conditions are generally caused by a tumor on the adrenal gland. So, you know, the cancer is causing the production or of too much or not enough cortisol. The pancreas is the next endocrine gland I want to talk about. And the pancreas also exists as an exocrine gland. So it has both types of roles. The exocrine gland is because it makes digestive enzymes that are directly put into the small intestine. So you see we've got a pancreatic duct here moving down the pancreas that then empties into the small intestine, producing those digestive enzymes. But then there are also other cells that produce two hormones among others, but two hormones that are involved in blood glucose control, glucagon and insulin. And so this diagram over here on the right is showing here are your exocrine cells producing the pancreatic enzymes that will flow down the pancreatic ducts. But then over here we have other types of cells that are going to produce the hormones involved in blood glucose control. So here are our pancreatic hormones. Glucagon raises blood sugar levels by stimulating the breakdown of glycogen, which has been produced by the liver and stored there, sometimes also stored in muscle cells. Glycogen, you remember, is the starch form, or the body storage form of glucose in uh, animals, so that including humans, that glucose is linked together in long chains and stored as glucagon, ready to be broken down when needed. Insulin has the opposite effect. It lowers blood glucose levels by stimulating body cells or facilitating the absorption of glucose by body cells, especially rest resting skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, adipose tissue cells. Um, these are all ones that use insulin to move glucose in. The blood does not need it, and muscle cells, when they are actively working, also do not need insulin. Insulin also is involved in increasing protein synthesis by increasing amino acid transport into the cell, so, but it's known most uh, widely for its involvement in blood glucose levels. So, of course, the disorder of the pancreas hormones that, that is much too common, unfortunately, is diabetes mellitus. And this diabetes type comes in two different forms, type 1, which used to be known as juvenile onset because it tends to appear early on in someone's life when they are still a child, is actually an autoimmune disease where body cells are attacking their own other cells. It, it uh, is destroying the cells in, that make the um, insulin in the body, so the pancreas is, is not able to make it anymore because the cells have been attacked and destroyed. Type 2 diabetes, which is what is most common in this country, is because for, uh, occurs because the insulin receptors on the cells become unresponsive. They do not um, allow insulin into the cell, so they are present, but they are not working right. So this little diagram down below, on the left, we see the blood full of blood sugar, but there are no insulin um, cell molecules present to be moved into the cell. On the right, we have type 2 diabetes where insulin is present, these little orange dots, but it is not picked up by the receptors. The receptors do not carry the insulin and the glucose into the body cells. Type 2 diabetes is uh, caused or, or occurs often with obesity, and so uh, that's why it's becoming much more common in the United States and because of the high level of obesity. So one of the ways to actually gain back some of this responsiveness to insulin is losing weight, that it can be just a temporary condi condition that is able to be reversed. Um, and a person does not need to go on or does not need to stay on injected insulin. Someone with type 1 diabetes is going to be needing to be taking insulin regularly because their body does not produce any at all. 
There are other glands that are known as endocrine glands that we're not uh, focusing on quite so much, but I uh, just wanted to run through some of the important hormones. The pineal gland, if you remember, we saw that um, in the more in the interior of the brain, but towards the posterior side, and it secretes melatonin, which is involved in our sleep-wake cycle. When your eyes are in the dark, your brain produces more melatonin, your pineal gland produces more melatonin, which encourages you to fall asleep. But when you are in a brightly lit situation, the sensors in your retina decrease the production of melatonin, which is why some people take melatonin to help equalize their uh, sleeping habits to recover from jet lag, because it is involved naturally in your circadian or your sleep-wake cycles. The thymus gland, which is down below your breastbone, promotes the development of certain lymphocytes called T-cells. When we get to the immune system, you'll hear more about the T-cells, which mature in the thymus gland. Then you have your various reproductive organs, the gonads. The ovaries are producing estrogen and progesterone. The testes produce testosterone. We'll talk more about that when we get to reproduction at the end of the course. And then other organs produce certain hormones. For example, you're in your digestive system. Your stomach produces gastrin in response to food entering the stomach. Gastrin as a hormone triggers then the release of pepsinogen, which becomes can be broken down into pepsin, which digests the protein. Likewise, in your small intestine, as food moves into your small intestine, the hormone cholecystokinin is released, and it then stimulates the release of enzymes from the pancreas down the pancreatic duct, so that your stomach and your small intestine have hormones that they um, produce in response to food moving through those organs. The heart has hormones that it produces in response to increased blood pressure that relax the arterioles and inhibit the production of aldosterone so that less water is reabsorbed so that blood volume will go down so blood pressure will go down. And the kidneys, we've already talked about erythropoietin or the production of red blood cells because your kidneys are sensing that the level of red blood cells is too low in the blood. And so these are other hormones that are produced in organs that we don't think of as necessarily being glandular. Um, they've got other roles to play, but they're also part of the endocrine system. There are things that happen to your endocrine system as you age. Your glands decrease in size. Um, your muscles, you know, production goes down so that you have an increased risk of infection and increased osteoporosis. You lose some muscle strength. You may develop insulin resistance, especially if weight increases at the same time. Um, people tend to have problems with sleeping as they age because melatonin secretion is not uh, so strong. And then, of course, you know, sex hormones decrease overall, and women will cease ovulating at menopause. But in general, the endocrine system remains fairly stable. So unlike some of our other systems, this one is probably stays in the best shape as we age. So that covers what I wanted to talk about with the endocrine system. As I said, this is the only video for this unit.